Okay, so today's lecture is on the zeroth law of turbulence and its discontents. So first of all, let me tell you what the zeroth law of turbulence is. <coughs> this is a statement which you'll find in Frischer's uh, excellent book on the subject. Um, if in an experiment on turbulent flow, all control parameters are fixed, except for the viscosity, which is lowered as much as possible, uh, the energy dissipation per unit mass uh, approaches a non-zero limit. And in fact, I was very interested by Alan's lecture yesterday because it was a beautiful setup for this statement. This is one of the dissipative anomalies that Alan mentioned as a consequence of the fact that the k to the minus 5 thirds spectrum uh, converges if you integrate out to k equal infinity. So I'll start with an example, an historical example of the zeroth law of turbulence, uh, which is due to Joule, uh, who was a very wealthy man. His family owned breweries in um, northern England. And um, as a result, he went to um, Niagara Falls on his honeymoon. <laughs> and uh, as a result of the trip, he said the following, if my views be correct, a fall of 800 feet will generate one degree of heat and the temperature of the river of Niagara will be raised by one-fifth of a degree by its fall of 160 feet. So here's the calculation that Joule was doing. He's saying the heat capacity of water, which he was the first person to measure back in the family brewery, um, times delta T is equal to the potential energy which is released by going over the falls. So that's G is 10 meters per second per second, 160 feet is 48 meters, divide by 4,200, and you get 1.16 Kelvin, okay? Uh, Joule is talking about Fahrenheit degrees, so this is Kelvin. Um, and uh, so the reason this is relevant to the zeroth law of turbulence is that the dissipation, the transformation of mechanical energy or potential energy uh, into heat requires viscosity, uh, but the coefficient is of viscosity is pretty small. For water, it's 10 to the minus 6 mKs. Um, and Joule takes it as completely obvious or not worthy of comment that the value of the viscosity is completely irrelevant to the calculation he's just done. Okay? So this is the zeroth law of turbulence, that if the viscosity is small enough, you don't have to worry about it, basically. And this is also uh, another message to take away from this is that um, conservation of mechanical energy is what you might call a fragile conservation law. It's broken by uh, viscosity very easily. Okay? We don't actually conserve uh, mechanical energy in real fluid mechanics because of viscosity, even though the viscosity is very small. Uh, and the story is that as part of, um, as part of the um, calculation, Joule actually successfully measured the increase in temperature at the bottom of the falls. Now, uh, how many reasons can we think of that that's probably not true? <laughs> but that part of the story, at least, uh, is apocryphal. I beg your pardon? No, he couldn't stop Niagara Falls, but he could collect a sample of water at the top and a sample at the bottom and measure delta T. That's Yes, th yes, that's right. So there's lots of reasons, and there's an amusing letter by Craig Boren in the American Journal of Physics about this. So the temperature increase that he calculated is 0.1 degrees, and the variation of air temperature over 50 meters uh, is probably bigger than that. Just taking the average tropospheric lapse rate of 6.6 .6 degrees, for instance, you'd expect a bigger delta T due to the lapse rate between the top and the bottom of the falls. And then there's all sorts of questions about air, drop, air drops, evaporative cooling of spray. And so the temperature uh, increase that he was talking about is probably much, would be buried under a lot of noise and probably unmeasurable. Let's talk about another example, which is a perhaps cleaner example of the zeroth law, which is the drag on a body. Uh, historically, cannonballs were of great interest. Uh, but here, I think we're going to talk about cars, for instance. And the formula is the following. 
that the drag on a body moving through a fluid of density rho is uh, C sub D, which is a function of the Reynolds number. This is the drag coefficient um, times the cross-sectional area of the body times the square of the velocity. Okay, So there is a dependence on viscosity because it's hidden in the definition of the Reynolds number. So the statement of the zeroth law is that the drag coefficient C sub D uh, goes to a non-zero value in the limit as R goes to infinity. So C sub D goes to a constant and therefore the drag force does not depend on viscosity. So here's from Frisch's book again. Uh, here's a graph of C sub D. I think it's for a sphere in a wind tunnel. So it's a function of R. Here is the Stokes flow regime where the Reynolds number is quite small. Uh, there's interesting changes. There's the drag crisis to do with sudden reattachment of the boundary layer on the sphere. But after all that excitement is over, uh, the belief, and I'm not 100% sure it's true experimentally, is that this function uh, approaches a constant way out here as the Reynolds number goes to infinity. Okay? And so when engineers say the drag coefficient, what they, what they invariably mean is this non-zero limit. So if you go to sources like, I think there's a good article in Wikipedia, uh, they'll give you drag coefficients that have been measured by engineers for various bodies in fluid flow. And they're always talking about the asymptotic limit. So uh, the point is, there's no drag without viscosity. But the ultimately, the value of nu is irrelevant, or as we'd say today, nu going to zero is a singular limit. Okay. And this is the zeroth law of turbulence. So Bill, m many people think that even without viscosity, there would be exactly the same drag. Yes, that's right. That's the Onsaga idea that there's a, a finite time limit. And yeah, I'm not planning to talk about it because I'm probably not competent to talk about it. Yeah, um, Onsager argued that you, there was actually some sort of uh, finite time limit which would occur even in the absence of viscosity that would result in things reaching molecular scales so that the, the real presence of molecules would do this even if the viscosity was zero. Things would just go to zero scale. You don't want to argue against Onsager. Now, this of course is related uh, to a famous historical paradox in uh, fluid mechanics called D'Alembert's paradox. So let me read what D'Alembert said. Uh, you can tell he was a mathematician. The theory potential flow developed in all possible rigor gives at least in several cases a strictly vanishing resistance, a singular paradox which I leave to future geometers. So what D'Alembert is saying is he'd calculated the f using um, potential flow, for instance, he could calculate flow around a sphere um, and, you know, omega is zero, and he's assuming the viscosity is zero, and he gets zero drag. Okay. And I think the w use of the word singular is just a happy accident here. <laughs> it is a singular case, or a singular paradox, because it's a singular limit. If nu is anything other than zero, um, this calculation is wrong. And you can tell that things have reached a pretty bad state when chemists, Cyril Hinselwood was a chemist, start poking fun at you. So Hinselwood said, fluid mechanics is divided between hydraulic engineers like Joule, who observe phenomena which cannot be explained, and mathematicians like D'Alembert, who explain phenomena which cannot be observed. <laughs> so once again, here is the zeroth law of turbulence, which comes down firmly on the side of Joule and says that... Um, the value of viscosity is unimportant. If you're interested in uh, things like drag or heat flow is a case I'm going to be talking about today for a little bit. So let's talk about what's going on here a little bit. So here are the um, Navier-Stokes equations. And uh, div u is zero. We'll talk about flow in a uh, container with, say, no slip or no penetration on the walls. And what we can do is take the dot product of the um, momentum equation here with U and integrate over the volume of the container. Uh, terms like this would vanish. The pressure U dot grad P vanishes because it's div U P, which integrates to a boundary flux, which is zero because there's no energy coming through the, 
walls of the blender. And so we get the rate of working of the force, which is agitating the fluid, uh, minus the dissipation of energy due to viscosity, which can be written as the volume integral of vorticity over the container using some vector identities. If you haven't done this calculation, you should go away in the privacy of your own home and understand why uh, we get the square of the vorticity here as the dissipative term. And the zeroth law of turbulence is simply the statement that as nu goes to zero, this guy approaches a non-zero limit. So in other words, the amount of vorticity in the fluid goes to infinity like one over nu, so that the product uh, is independent of nu in the limit. Okay? So this is a singular limit. Turbulence is a singular limit in that sense. Another way of thinking of it, of course, is there's a cascade of eddy scales from some large injection scale, like the size of the blender, and then a self-similar inertial cascade going down in scale um, till we reach uh, a point where viscosity intervenes, if we don't believe in Onsager. And that smallest possible scale is the Kolmogorov length. And on dimensional grounds, by the way, epsilon is the injection rate. right? That's the rate at which the blades of the blender are putting energy into the fluid. And <coughs> the dimensions of epsilon, as I said yesterday, are watts per kilogram, which is also length squared over time cubed. Okay, So from those dimensions and viscosity, you can build one length, which is the Kolmogorov scale or the dissipation scale. Now, as an aside, yesterday we're talking about turbulence in the ocean, and I think it's good to note that the ocean is turbulent, but not very much. Okay, Every fluid you're familiar with in your day-to-day -day life is probably more turbulent than the ocean in the sense that it has uh, a smaller Kolmogorov scale. So, for instance, if we may... I'm, I'm not too sure about my numbers here, but here's what I tried to do. Let's estimate the Kolmogorov scale uh, when we stir a cup of coffee. Okay. So nu cubed is 10 to the minus 18. And I for epsilon, I got 0.1 watts per kilogram. I wouldn't defend this too strongly, but I was saying my hand would expend, say, 0.01 watts when I stir my coffee. No, not very much. And it weighs one kilogram. So I plug in the numbers, and I get 6 times 10 to the minus 5, uh, or 60 microns for the Kolmogorov scale in a cup of coffee when you stir it. Sorry? And <laughs> yes, there's a lot of coffee there. <laughs> yeah. And as I said yesterday, uh, there's Oki's rule for the ocean. Remember Neil Oki, who said that um, a typical um, epsilon in the ocean, when you're away from boundaries, somewhere in the interior, and it's also pretty close to the volume average of epsilon, is one hair dryer per cubic kilometer, uh, which, when you plug the numbers, gives you a Kolmogorov scale, which is a lot bigger than what you get in a coffee cup. Okay? So in that sense, if the size of the Kolmogorov scale is any indication of the intensity of turbulence, uh, a turbulent cup of coffee is more turbulent than the ocean. Although, of course, the ocean has a larger range of scales. So that's my, uh, this is a break I've described uh, the zeroth law of turbulence, this is a good place to ask any questions before I talk about examples of flow, flows uh, which can never be turbulent according to the zeroth law. Y yes, there's a question. Can you, can you say again why smaller called Margaret scale means higher turbulence? Um, I just think it's a... No, I'm not going to say it means... That I, I suppose I mean that smaller Kolmogorov scale is just an indication that the cascade has gone to smaller scales. And uh, yeah, well, I guess you could just compare epsilon, right? Uh, when I worked out epsilon here for my cup of coffee, I got 0.1 watts per kilogram. And when I looked at it and when I follow Oki's rule in the ocean, I get 10 to the minus 9 watts per kilogram. So in that sense, the dissipation rate in the ocean is smaller by a factor of 10 to the 8 than the typical dissipation rate in stirred coffee. Yeah. Yes, the Reynolds number in the ocean is much larger and there's a much larger range of spatial scales because you go down from the planetary scale right to down to the, well, the Kolmogorov scale, for instance, which is a few millimeters. So um, examples of flows that can never be turbulent according to the zeroth law. 
Uh, one of them is what's called horizontal convection, or HC, as I'll call it. <laughs> uh, so the motivation for this problem is the following, and Raf mentioned it yesterday, so did I. Uh, the ocean is heated and cooled mostly at the sea surface. I'm ignoring uh, geothermal heat flux through the bottom for this discussion. And horizontal convection is going to be the most idealized situation in which we can study the implications of this observation. So for instance, many fans of rayleigh baynard convection will tell you that it's a fundamental uh, process problem for understanding convection in a geophysical situation. Oceanographers do not believe that for a second because the ocean is not significantly heated at the bottom. The problem we should be doing to understand convection in the ocean uh, is a non-uniformly heated surface with practically no heat through the coming through the bottom. Okay? So this is the horizontal convection problem. And there are several reasons for studying it. Uh, to quote Henry Stommel, uh, one of the striking features of the, <coughs> of the ocean circulation is the smallness at the ocean surface of the regions where deep and bottom water is formed. And we'll see that horizontal convection uh, gives you an immediate laboratory realization of that fundamental observation about the ocean. Uh, the reason I got interested in this was the opening uh, few lines of this um, influential article by Monk and Wunsch, and what they say is, without deep mixing, the ocean would turn in a few thousand years into a stagnant pool of cold, salty water with equilibrium maintained locally by near-surface mixing and with very weak convective surface-intensified circulation. The result follows from Sandstrom's theorem for a fluid which is heated and cooled at the surface. I had no idea what Sandstrom's theorem was, and I'll maybe I'll manage to give you an idea of what this mysterious Sandstrom theorem is. But what they're saying uh, is that if there weren't winds and tides, if there was no supply of mechanical energy, and the only thing you had was non-uniform um, heating at the surface of the ocean, then the whole fluid would be stagnant in the interior, even if the Rayleigh number was 10 to the 29. Okay. Yeah. So if there weren't any uh, tides and winds, would uh, the stratification in the, in the ocean wi uh, will the, uh, be the same? No, they're saying sp absolutely not. They're saying that all the stratification in the ocean would be in a, say, three-meter thick layer at the surface. We'll call this the Sandstrom Ocean. It's an idealized thought experiment where we switch off all mechanical energy supply, no winds, no tides, no fish. No, no geothermal heating. The only thing we've got is non-uniformly heated surface. This is horizontal convection. And what they're saying is in that situation, uh, the whole ocean interior would be stagnant. All the stratification would be in the top 10 meters. Very thin layer at the surface. And that follows from the mysterious Sandstrom theorem. So here's how you can do it in more idealized geometry. You can simply take, say, a... Um, a rectangular container, it should be three-dimensional, it will be three-dimensional when I show you lab experiments, and you impose non-uniform temperature at the surface, and what happens? So the isotherms, oh, by the way, I'm going to fall into an, ocean, an oceanographic habit of using uh, this variable B buoyancy rather than temperature when I talk about this. So this is a definition of buoyancy. Um, it uh, has dimensions of acceleration, and if you want to relate it to uh, more conventional notation uh, that you may have seen, it's simply G alpha uh, T minus some reference temperature. That would be familiar to people who do um, rayleigh baynard convection. Now, talking about rayleigh baynard convection, um, there's a very important constraint on horizontal convection, which has no analog at all in the rayleigh baynard case. This is the zero flux constraint. So what I mean by that uh, we've got non-uniform temperature at the surface and we've got no flux of buoyancy or heat through any of the other boundaries of our box. So there's no buoyancy coming in the bottom. Okay? That means there's no buoyancy going through any level in the middle of the box. So the overbar here is a horizontal average and a time average if the flow is unsteady. Okay? So that's saying that the Total flux of buoyancy through this level, which is uh, advective, a correlation of WB would produce a buoyancy flux, 
and a small amount of diffusion, perhaps, those guys have to sum to zero. And that has to be true at every Z, starting at the bottom and going all the way to the top. So the heat is coming in where the surface temperature is hot, and an equal amount of heat is going out where the surface temperature is cold, and there's no net flux of heat through the surface, okay? horizontally averaged. So this is from uh, Jeff Vallis's book. So here are some two-dimensional uh, solutions, and it's pretty much what you'd expect on the basis of Sandstrom's, uh, of um, the statement at the beginning of Munch and Wunsch. Uh, you impose uh, non-uniform temperature at the surface, and um, as you increase the Rayleigh number from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9, you form a very thin surface boundary layer. The whole interior of the box uh, fills with the densest available fluid at the surface, so there's a minimum temperature at the surface, which in this uh, numerical calculation is specified here, and in the limit of viscosity going to zero, say, uh, the whole of the interior of the box is very close to the minimum surface temperature. And the prediction is that, uh, well, hmm, Sandstrom would lead you to, well, I, I'll come back to Sandstrom in a second. So that's what Munch and Wunsch are saying. Il the question is, are they keeping the Prandtl number fixed? And uh, yes, they are, yeah. This is the stream function that in this two-dimensional simulation. And you can see that uh, all of most of the circulation is um, compressed near the surface. This really disturbs, this result really disturbs a whole bunch of people. Uh, in particular, the uh, group at the Australian National University doesn't believe it for a second. And th I think they're right to be very skeptical. So here's the lab experiment they've done. Uh, here's a box. I think it's actually a big container. It's like, I've seen it. It's more than a meter long. And <coughs> they, um, they cool the right half of the box and they heat the left half of the box. Discontinuous condition at the middle. And this is showing, this big picture here is showing the left-hand half of the box. So what they're, what they're seeing is a very rapid flow in a boundary layer at the bottom. Oh, and I should also say I've now turned the problem upside down, so don't get confused about this. Ocean with oceanographers, it's uh, non-uniform buoyancy at the surface. As soon as you go to the lab, it's non-uniform buoyancy at the bottom. Okay, so that's what they're doing in the lab here. Um, and what they're seeing uh, is I'll say a turbulent plume going up the wall of the box here. Uh, slow sinking towards the boundary, towards the non-uniformly heated boundary everywhere in the center, which is exactly what Raf was talking about yesterday as a conceptual model of what's going on in the ocean. And um, a good explanation, perhaps, of Stommel's original uh, remark that we expect an asymmetry between the sinking and rising regions in the ocean. So, for instance, the only place where the fluid is going up in this lab experiment is in the plume. Okay? Everywhere else in the box, over 99% you know, of the box, the motion is down towards the non-uniformly heated boundary. The box fills with the lightest available fluid. All of these are in contrast to rayleigh baynard convection. The box fills with the lightest available fluid. Um, the horizontal scale is set by the uh, box size, unlike rayleigh baynard convection where you have a selected uh, cell size or a most unstable wave number, which would at least describe the cells that you'd see close to onset. And another difference between um, horizontal convection and rayleigh baynard convection is that the critical Rayleigh number for horizontal convection is zero. That is, the smallest delta T applied at this boundary is sufficient to set the fluid into motion. There's no steady conductive solution. Okay, there's a question. for you, it's a question for them, but how well do they satisfy the um, no-flux boundary condition on the other boundaries? Um, they claim they do it very well. Mm. Well, there's no, reason to, there's no reason to disbelieve these experiments. I think that this the is... The plume certainly, at least on the scale of the plume, doesn't satisfy no-flux. This is a very insulated sidewall here. If you look at the lab experiment, it's sheathed in styrofoam and they 
they pull off a six inch or one foot thick slab of styrofoam so they can take this photograph and then put it back. <laughs> yeah. I do not understand your statement uh, about the horizontal scale of the overturning. In yeah. the because in a Rayleigh Benard convection, uh, in a nonlinear uh, or turbulent regime, you can have a roll whose uh, size is set by the box, too. Oh, you can? Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, I guess what I'm saying is if you have a small enough box, but if you do, uh, as, as Krishnamurti did in um, at FSU, if you have a really big box with large aspect ratio, uh, then even in the strongly nonlinear Rayleigh Baynard regime, you see lots of rolls. Yeah, so if you have a small box, yes, it'll be set by the box scale, but not in general. Um, maybe I missed that point, but I assume that this experiment is more or less 3D. Yes, of course. But that's very much different to uh, the numerical experiments you showed before, which yes. were 2D. Yes. So you have more degrees of freedom in yes. this one. Yes. So yes. That, that could be an explanation. It could. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, so that's right. Uh, this, I'm saying this is completely misleading, really. You can't argue with the lab experiment. Yes. The question is, also the gravity is the other way around. Uh, it's not really, there's a, what's called the Boussinesque symmetry, which is that if, you, if the Boussinesque equations um, have a certain symmetry, which is you can change z to minus z, and believe me, we could, uh, in fact, it has been tested numerically, uh, sorry, in the lab. Uh, this problem is exactly the same as heating, non-uniformly heating the top, okay? You can just turn it around uh, and it looks the same. So why are the sinking regions in horizontal convection so small? It's really obvious. You've got this zero flux constraint at every level z. Clearly the plume is a much more efficient way of transporting heat upwards than the slow downwelling in the interior. So the only way those two different, those two very different types of flow can come into a no flux regime is because the plume it only occupies a small amount of space and most of the box is filled with downwelling. Okay. That's the short answer. And that's, I think, a good answer to Stommel's question. Okay, now I'm going to show that um, horizontal convection cannot satisfy the zeroth law of turbulence, literally cannot satisfy it. Um, and you can think of that, that turbulent plume as I uh, go through this calculation. It's pretty easy. Here are the equations of Boussinesque motion. Here's the buoyancy, the thermal equation, if you like. I tossed in rotation because it doesn't make a scrap of difference to the argument. Um, we work out, we once again work out the power integral. That is, we multiply the momentum equation by U and we integrate over the box. So here's the viscous dissipation. I wrote it as the square of the vorticity previously. I've now changed my notation and I'm writing it like that. It's the same thing. And here's the source of mechanical energy. When I take u dot this equation, I get wb from that term. That's the only surviving term, and that's the only source of mechanical energy, is the volume integral of wb. Okay. Now I can get another expression from w for wb if I take the buoyancy equation. Oh, by the way, in these angular brackets, what do I mean by that? I mean uh, integrate over the box. Uh, divide by the volume of the box to make it an average, and then average, if it's unsteady, average in time long enough to get rid of any unsteady confusion. Okay? So it's just a com the angular brackets means a complete space-time average, and that's saying after all that averaging, the viscous dissipation is equal to the release of potential energy by uh, vertical advection. I can get another expression by multiplying the buoyancy equation by minus z and integrating over the volume, and I get that expression. Let me do this a different way for you. Let me... Uh, I'm just going to use the zero flux constraint, which is that the horizontal average of WB, 
minus kappa, the horizontal average of BZ is zero. Right? So this is horizontally average, that's what the bar means as opposed to the angular bracket, which is a volume average. So I get a volume average if I simply integrate this with respect to Z from say zero to H and divide by H. And of course, when I do that with this term, I get kappa B bar at the surface uh, plus kappa uh, B bar at the bottom because that's a Z derivative. And this is now the total volume integral. And I have to divide by H. And this is now the total volume integral of WB. And this is the difference between the horizontally average buoyancy at the surface, the horizontally averaged uh, buoyancy at the bottom, divided by the depth of the box. Okay. That's what you get over here. Okay. I think it's kind of surprising for a reason which we'll come to Im immediately now. Um, because if I now eliminate WB between the two equations, I get that the viscous dissipation is equal to kappa over H times the difference between the buoyancy at the top and the buoyancy at the bottom. Um, and remember the buoyancy, at, and there's a thing called the maximum principle, which I think you'll find physically intuitive. Um, there's a certain range of buoyancy specified by the boundary condition at the top. Uh, let's call that delta B. It's the total difference in buoyancies that, you, that can occur anywhere in the fluid. And this difference has to be less than that specified delta B. Okay. So epsilon, the viscous dissipation, is kappa times this externally specified parameter divided by H. And now if I let uh, nu go to zero, with the Prandtl number fixed, then uh, this epsilon goes to zero. Okay? So I think it's kind of surprising in the sense that um, this is a very direct proof uh, that horizontal convection, uh, easy proof actually, does not satisfy the zeroth law of turbulence. Okay? So, uh, uh, I am, so it's here it's horizontal. Why do have, when have you used that it is horizontal? I've used, well, the zero, th um, the zero flux constraint. The zero flux constraint uh, is, a, is only true for horizontal convection. It's not true for rayleigh baynard convection, for instance, where you heat the bottom and there's a non-zero flux independent of Z passing through the fluid. So it's the zero flux constraint is the crucial fact about horizontal convection which is used in this proof, and that's why you cannot do this for rayleigh baynard convection. So this is true I, uh, either for two-dimensional flow and three-dimensional flow? Yeah, two, three, doesn't matter. But wouldn't it be fair to say that another way to interpret that result to say in the limit of nu going to zero for nu over kappa fixed, you are not forcing the system because there is no diffusion of heat into the system. So yeah. you're not choking the turbulence, you're not forcing the system. I'd say the, supply of the saying the supply of energy is proportional to the molecular viscosity. So it's okay. not that there is no turbulence, it's an unforced system, so there should be no motion in an unforced system. Well, that your argument would also say that rayleigh baynard convection should have no motion. Well, no, there is always a force in the, the flux is prescribed. No, rayleigh baynard you prescribe the temperature, for instance. But in order to have a flux kappa times, the gradient must be finite because... Yes. So there's a big discussion about the zeroth law of turbulence in rayleigh baynard convection, and people argue about whether, okay, there's a diffusive flux of heat coming in the bottom, uh, it's equal to kappa dt dz, um, <coughs> but as kappa goes to zero, maybe dt dz is scales like one over kappa, that would give you the, what's called the ultimate regime, where the flux of heat through the system is independent of kappa, that's the zeroth law of turbulence. So that's saying, I'm sorry, in the horizontal convection case, that can never happen. 
right, we're on. <laughs> <laughs> I've forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the important thing is that in uh, the zeroth law of turbulence requires essentially a leakage to infinity, even in the uh, vanishing viscosity limit. Here, what's happening is essentially you're driving very large scale motion. So there, there's no place, there's no place for the energy to go. In the zeroth law of turbulence, like for Kolmogorov, the energy gets very quickly to very small scales. As you said, even in the zero viscosity limit, it would be down to molecular scales. So it's absorbed there, as it were. And uh, so it's not too surprising. I, I think it's, it's a little misleading to say this is a very surprising result, but <laughs> that's just an opinion. Okay. Uh, whether it's surprising or not, I would like to address one remark, which I think is quite important. Um, so we have, <coughs> it's not that this, uh, this result isn't saying that you can't have a turbulent cascade. It's saying that the supply of energy is choked as nu goes to zero. Now, it's, uh, it's also not saying that the f you have a large-scale boring circulation. In fact, I showed you a lab experiment with uh, a plume, which people describe as turbulent. So uh, what's going on? Here's our expression for the Kolmogorov length. Let me see if I can remember it. It's, is it u cubed over epsilon to the one quarter? Let's happily insert our expression for epsilon there. So that's nu cubed and epsilon is kappa delta B at the surface uh, with an H which now moves upstairs all to the one quarter. Okay. So nu over kappa is the Prandtl number which is fixed. So if I just isolate the dependence on nu, this guy is proportional to nu to the one half power because I'm leaving one of my nu's there to take care of the kappa. So it's the fourth root of nu squared nu to the one half. So <coughs> that's saying that um, a vanishing Kolmogorov scale is completely consistent with this um, limit, with this bound on var epsilon. So you, there's plenty of room at the bottom for a cascade. You could, it's just that the uh, Kolmogorov length scale is going to zero like nu to the one half rather than uh, nu to the three quarters if you imagine var epsilon was fixed. Okay, So I think this is also one of the things which is producing controversy in this subject. Uh, it's the fact that when you look at the lab experiments, uh, even though they don't satisfy the zeroth law of turbulence, they perhaps do satisfy the first law of turbulence, which is that there's a c still the possibility of a cascade to small scales. Ben, may, may I ask you a question? I mean, in this experiment, have, have we seen a statistically stationary state? Because what may happen is that uh, this convection we see uh, on the picture is will transient. Will is transient. It, it will put some uh, some uh, uh, cold water, maybe rivers here, and then it, the, the tank will fill progressively with. Uh, and then uh, stratify in a way that it will become stable. Isn't it the case? The experimentalists are sensitively aware of that criticism and all I can do is say that, you know, they run for days in an attempt to many diffusion times, or many, sorry, many apparent mixing times. Uh, I've actually made this argument to them and uh, they insist, the subject is controversial, let me say that, and I, <laughs> and I respect their point of view actually, because, you know, when you look at the lab experiments, uh, you d you see something which looks like a turbulent plume, right? Robustly, yeah. Which seems very natural for the initial stage. Yes, yes. So now let me say that uh, some of this discussion was anticipated in a very confusing way, but uh, perhaps an insightful way actually, by um, Sandstrom, a Swedish oceanographer in 1908, who had a result which in oceanography is called the Sandstrom Theorem, and I've put air quotes, or actually not air quotes, I've put quotes around theorem here. And here's the statement that you can read in textbooks like uh, Defant. Um, a closed steady circulation 
can only be maintained if the heat source is below the, the closed source. That should be cold. That's the danger of autocomplete. If the heat source is below the cold source, okay? So that's the Rayleigh Baynard intuition where the heat source is below the cold source. Um, and <coughs> so there are many endorsements of the theorem, like Munk and Munch, it's in the opening lines of their paper. Uh, Wang, anyway, these are all oceanographers and meteorologists who have quoted the theorem. Um, and there's also many counterexamples, starting with Jeffreys, 1925, who pointed out that Sandstrom's argument neglected uh, molecular diffusivity. Um, and we've seen molecular diffusivity of heat, which we've seen is pretty important. Um, and notice that some of the counterexamples are by people who've endorsed the theorem. <laughs> um, and here's the numerical counterexample. Uh, this is actually a two-dimensional example done by my collaborator Francesco Paparella, which shows that, okay, it's not turbulent, but it's not really laminar either. Right? This is a 2D case, which becomes unstable. So you might ask, why don't oceanographers just forget about Sandstrom? And here are some of the things they say. Well, horizontal convection is in a vigorous flow. Who knows what vigorous means? Uh, horizontal convection produces a thin thermocline. You need winds, tides, and breaking internal gravity waves to explain deep ocean circulation. Uh, this is, the, I think, the majority opinion in oceanography. Uh, here's a statement from a textbook. Strict interpretation of the theorem is difficult. <laughs> I don't think strict interpretation of the theorem is difficult at all. You can simply remove the quotation marks and say, here is the theorem that um, the mechanical energy dissipation is proportional to kappa. That takes care of Jeffries's criticism of Sandstrom. And it's given by the rest of this simple formula. Um, and so, for instance, when Wunsch and Ferrari show zero here, this is what they're saying. Okay? And uh, oceanographers shouldn't talk about theorems. It's not our business. We're not mathematicians. So let's not talk about theorems. Let's just put ballpark numbers into the formula and see what epsilon is, okay? We don't have to worry about limits or anything. We can say that delta T is 25 degrees Kelvin, G is 10. That implies a maximum buoyancy difference of five times 10 to the minus two meters per second squared at the surface of the ocean, corresponding to say 25 degrees of, of temperature difference. So that tells me what B max is. I use the molecular diffusivity kappa. I take H to be 5,000 meters, and I get 10 to the minus 12 watts per kilogram as epsilon. Remember Oki's number, which is 10 to the minus 9. Okay? So that's saying that's why 0 is appearing here. It's because this bound is so strict that it gives you a number which is smaller by a factor of 10 to the minus 3 uh, than observed ocean dissipation rates. So now the debate focuses on whether epsilon is really important uh, for ocean circulation. So the, the, uh, the critics of this theorem say that epsilon is completely unimportant and we're just deluding ourselves by um, focusing on it as a crucial thing. So can I ask whether that calculation is really fair? Because in the ocean you also have a flux boundary condition, so technically you can't use a fixed temperature boundary condition. Uh, yeah, no, it's completely fair because even if you use flux boundary conditions, you just repeat all the calculations that led to this result. You get exactly the same result, whether it's flux or temperature, which is fixed. And now I'm just using it in a diagnostic way. I'm saying we observe delta T as 25 Kelvin. That's not controversial. Everything else follows. So c can, I, can I go on? So for instance, uh, with uh, climate, climate warming, so here we have a big transient now. And so in the first picture of uh, Raffaele, we have seen plumes of uh, hot water going down. So could this become very different during this transient? I don't know that it has. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, of course, you can repeat all the calculations, and you'll have time derivatives of things appearing in these results, which I set to zero because of time averaging, but you could work out the unsteady uh, analogs keeping those terms. I'm not sure it would be that useful, but yeah, I, I, I don't feel that I'm answering your question. <coughs> 
Yeah, so, you know, the fact that this is smaller by a factor of a thousand than observed numbers says, you know, you're really struggling against... I beg your pardon? Uh, so someone is saying it's a, it's a turbulent diffusivity, um, but I guess, you know, what we're trying to do is explain the, this whole diagram, I think as Raffaelli will talk about in his next lecture, is trying to explain the energy source for the turbulent diffusivity, okay? So this is saying if all you've got is heating and cooling, if you're in the Sandstrom Ocean, um, the level um, of turbulent energy dissipation is going to be smaller by a factor of a thousand than what we observe. So in other words, the Sandstrom Ocean, this idealized thought experiment ocean, cannot make its own mixing. Presumably, horizontal convection can still contribute to energy in the real ocean, even though it can't in the Sandstrom Ocean, right? Uh, okay, there is the idea that um, you could assume there's a um, you could assume there's a turbulent kappa, kappa sub t for turbulent, bigger by a factor of a thousand than the um, molecular kappa. Yeah, uh, then you would get the number. But where does the turbulent kappa come from? Yes, <laughs> and tides. So, B Bill, so y y the argument was a bit too fast for me. So y you compute the epsilon this way, you get a bound for epsilon. So you compare it to 10 to the minus 9 you discussed previously. Yes. And then from this, you deduce that there should be zero there on the diagram for heating and cooling e energy, right? Yes, that's right. So can you explain the relation between the fact that the two epsilon are different and the fact that you should put zero there, is it obvious? Uh, well, instead of putting zero, I think uh, Wunsch and Ferrari should have put 0 0.001, which is close enough to zero. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, so I see that you get 0 0.001 by dividing the two value of epsilon, but yeah. I don't see why it should be equated to the heating and cooling. You, you I mean, because as soon as you have the wind, uh, any, all of these arguments are not, are, yeah. no, are no more valid. So basically, maybe it's an argument to say that the heating and cooling energy should be much smaller than the wind energy, the, wi the, the energy provided by the wind, but st still it doesn't allow you to say that when wind are present and dominates, then the heating and cooling energy should be negligible. So I, th I think what you could argue is, okay, there's a turbulent kappa, kappa sub t, whose energy is supplied by the wind. And now I should use that turbulent kappa in here. So in that sense, the wind would have a catalytic effect in creating a large kappa, which would then allow the fluid to access uh, this horizontal convective. Yes, I, I can't discount that possibility although I've, I've never seen a, dis I mean a discussion of it. So for instance, if I want to put here, uh, rather than zero, 0 0.5 or one or, or whatever value, it should, uh, there is no argument to prevent that from uh, what you have discussed today. Yeah, so I guess what Raffaele is saying, um, if once again, in the ocean, the ocean, if you ignore geothermal heating for a second, which we deserves a lecture all of its own, um, the zero flux constraint is definitely satisfied. If there's no buoyancy coming in at the bottom, there'll be no buoyancy flux through any level in the middle of the ocean. R right? Right, but this is an energy flux. Yes, but the buoyancy flux is equal to the dissipation rate. After That's exactly what this equation is saying. This is valid w with or without wind? I'm sorry? This is valid w with the wind forcing and without the wind forcing? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So if okay. I went back to this equation and added an F, a mechanical energy supply, plus vector F right here, I would go through this calculation and there'd be an extra term over here, uh, U dot F, which would be the mechanical energy supply, okay?
Uh, this equation, on the other hand, would be completely unchanged because it's a consequence of the buoyancy equation. It doesn't see the force that we've added to the momentum equation. And you know, this would then say that the release of potential energy is controlled by, um, by molecular processes. Okay, Th thank you. Yeah, now, um, but you know, you, I think you're onto a point here because I'm gonna think you're coming down as one of the skeptics, which is good. But before I talk about more about the skeptics, um, here's an exercise for the students. It's surprisingly easy. We're using the Boussinesq equation, the Boussinesq approximation, where div u is zero. It's only an approximation to real fluid mechanics where the uh, mass conservation equation is not div u equals zero. It's this guy, and I'm using capital U for the exact u. What I want you to show is that the mysterious energy supply here in the, sa in the uh, horizontal convection problem is if you look at exact fluid mechanics, it's exactly equal to P div U, which is the standard exact expression for the conversion of internal energy into mechanical energy, okay? So that's saying this term, which looks kind of bizarre, I mean, who's ever seen anything like that before? It's really just a Boussinesq approximation to something which is real in the exact equations. One of the points that's not realized about the Boussinesq approximation is that if you do this exercise, you'll never doubt the Boussinesq approximation again. Throughout your careers, people will tell you you cannot trust it. It is completely reliable. You should hold it until it's ripped out of your cold, dead hand, right? And because what it's saying here is that um, this real physical energy source can be, is actually accurately calculated within the Boussinesq approximation, even though it relies on non-zero div u, okay? It's, it's very easy to do. And this was actually Sandstrom's point. His paper is difficult to read, it's confusing. Uh, what he was saying, what Sandstrom was saying, was that the energy source, uh, he wasn't using the Boussinesq approximation, he was using the full um, equations of motion and he was saying, well, the conversion is P div U in the ocean, div U is pretty small. Um, I can make arguments about pistons and things, and it just seems to me this has to be very, very small. And he's completely correct in that respect because of this. Okay, now the skeptics, of which there are many, <laughs> a few anyway, say this doesn't look like a laminar flow, come on. I've got this turbulent plume here. Uh, so for instance, Scotty and White in their discussion of all this say, we suggest that the zeroth law is too restrictive since according to this strict definition, uh, even canonical Rayleigh-Baynard convection would not be turbulent. Well, that's, that's true in the sense that with Rayleigh-Baynard convection, no one has ever observed the uh, ultimate regime in which things are independent of nu, um, but it's different, it's not entirely fair because in horizontal convection, we can actually prove that it never happens. Whereas in Rayleigh-Baynard convection, there's always the hope that if we could only increase the Rayleigh number more, uh, we would reach the ultimate regime. Uh, Griffith and Hughes say, well, horizontal convection can be interpreted in terms of mechanical energy budget, um, but a detailed understanding has not emerged. In other words, what they, I think what these guys are saying is, okay, we've got these formulas which relate the uh, potential energy release to various things, but this is only superficial and they're not really telling us anything about what's going on actually in a real three-dimensional situation like this with the plume. Can you say again th this argument? Is it uh, related to local energy budget? Or you mean this, this argument yeah, yeah, here? Wha what's the well, okay, so <coughs> Now let's th think about the lab experiment. Um, what you could do is define an average flow by, for instance, averaging over the span-wise direction. Okay, it's a three-dimensional situation. So I could actually create a two-dimensional average flow by averaging over that direction. I'll call it W bar and B bar. Okay, so So what we have is that the volume average 
is really small. That's the right-hand side over there. But uh, W is equal to this two-dimensional average, W bar, which is a function of X and Z, uh, plus fluctuations, which depend on the span-wise direction Y. Right? And so I can now write this as the volume average of W bar B bar plus the volume average of W prime B prime is really small. So I think, <coughs> and I think this is what these guys are also saying, both of these, well, they're the same people. What they're saying is that this is large and positive, this is large and negative, and they cancel to incredible precision to give you something which is really small. But if you're only looking at the residual, uh, you're missing the fact that there's this large-scale overturning circulation in the box. Okay? That's why this result is described as being... Um, these results explain why convection is much stronger than might be inferred from previous emphasis on minor terms. So what they're saying, is before you do this decomposition, this is a minor term, and it's disguising this cancellation between two big things of almost opposite signs. Okay, so I finish with, um, and I should say that um, because of this confusion over what turbulence is and what it means, uh, Ed Spiegel has helpfully suggested that examples like this should be called thermalence rather than uh, turbulence. So I'll let, I wonder if, that, um, if that's going to catch on as a term. Okay, so I'm finished with um, horizontal convection and I'll start the next and final part of the talk, which is I think a non-controversial example of a flow that doesn't satisfy the zeroth law. And although it doesn't satisfy the zeroth law, uh, everyone is very happy to call 2D turbulence turbulence. <laughs> okay. So the key feature of 2D turbulence, if you know nothing about it at all, uh, is quite different from 3D turbulence. It's the robust conservation of energy. Uh, and the transfer of energy uh, from small to large scales. So that's the inverse cascade, negative viscosity, anti-friction, whatever you might like to call it. So <coughs> um, in 3D, uh, the singular limit results from vorticity production. So if I form the vorticity equation, I've got material advection of the vorticity, and I've got a vortex stretching term there, and viscosity. And it's simply a fact that in two dimensions, uh, the vortex stretching term is identically zero, okay? So um, there's no turbulence in flat land, only flatulence, according to Spiegel's rule that we should use different terms for these flows. Do you think it'll catch on? <laughs> So the special structure is that we can define a stream function, and then the vorticity is the Laplacian of the stream function, and then the curl of the momentum equation produces the 2D vorticity equation. I expect you've seen this before. And there are two conservation laws. Uh, <coughs> one is the conservation of energy, d by dt of the kinetic energy, the dissipation is proportional to the square of the vorticity again in the 2D case. And entropy, the dissipation of the squared vorticity, which is the entropy, um, relies on the gradients of the vorticity. Okay. So here's a, the only rigorous and simple result in the subject is the following. Um, this is negative definite, so at all times, the amount of entropy in the box is less than the initial entropy because it's only going down. That means that this integral here, which is the sink of kinetic energy, uh, is definitely bounded by its initial value. So if I take nu to zero, I lose the energy sink. So that's why the energy uh, is robustly conserved in 2D turbulence. It's because the squared vorticity can never be bigger than its initial value. There's no production of vorticity in two dimensions by stretching, by something analogous to stretching. Questions about this? Okay. <coughs>
Well, it, it, it maybe it's important to stress that uh, you have not dealt with the boundary condition, and that the boundary condition may change this. Yes, I've assumed harmless uh, boundary conditions, um, but I don't think. Yes. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, for instance, if we put the fluid in a square container with, say, no slip boundaries, uh, I believe this uh, equation would not change. This one would change because you can produce vorticity uh, through a flux through the boundaries, which offers the hope uh, that somehow you could get a singular limit, but I don't think this has ever been substantially observed, has it? Has it, or has well, it? so I, I'm not sure there is no theorem, but... Uh, yeah, there's no theorem, but... M Marie Farge has uh, tried to convey the idea numerically that this actually happens in some circumstances. Okay. Uh, it would be kind of surprising because, of course, then you'd have to specify the size of the box as a parameter, and you would think as you made the box bigger and bigger, the, uh, the perimeter would be less important to what's going on in the center, but okay. So keep in mind um, the, the connection between vorticity and stream function, which is just the uh, Poisson equation here. So if I show you a picture here and say one of these is the vorticity and one is the stream function, you can immediately tell which is which, right? Stream function and vorticity. So the stream function is a lot smoother than the vorticity. That's the, um, that's the reduction of small scales by the inverse Laplacian. So the way, things this way this works is, given the vorticity at t equals zero, calculate the stream function by solving this equation, evict the vorticity for a time dt, calculate the new stream function, and keep going. Now keep in mind uh, that the vorticity cannot mix down to arbitrarily small scales. That is, if I really took this um, vorticity here and stirred it up so that all the filaments went to very, very small scales and I mixed red next to blue, uh, the smoothing effect of the Laplacian would destroy energy. Okay? So the vorticity can't be mixed down to small scales. Some of it has to remain on large scales because the energy is always going to be conserved. I'm being asked, why is that? Um, I guess what I'm saying is, um, if you just do some little um, calculations, like you consider solving the equation del squared psi equals cos kx and calculating the kinetic energy of uh, psi as a function of k, uh, it's, it's going to zero as I make k larger. That's the filtering effect of the Laplacian, where you get cancellation between the positive and negative vorticities on small scales. Mathematically, you can use the Poincaré inequality to see that there is a, you should preserve a, a part of the entropy. Yeah, I'm about to do that on the next slide, but um, well, something very similar to it, I think. Um, I, I guess all I'm saying is, if I really did take this f red and blue stuff and stir it down to small scales and invert the uh, solve for the stream function, um, I would be I, I would be losing energy. And that's be, you know that's because of solving Laplace's equation or Poisson's equation because there's a source right. If the source has smaller and smaller scales in it, then um, the resulting energy is less and less as you make the scales smaller and smaller. There can be some transmission to small scales, but it can't all go to small scales. So in this example, uh, there are clearly small scales, but there's stuff left on large scales. And I think that's that's what I'm, I'm actually going to do, a slightly more mathematical version of that argument in the next two slides. So we're going to consider an ideal fluid <coughs> so that energy and entropy are both conserved for a second, that is, turn the viscosity off completely. Uh, then we can make a very plausible argument that uh, energy is transferred to large scales. So all I'm saying here is this is the energy written in terms of the energy spectrum. And here is the entropy uh, 
uh, written in terms of the energy spectrum with an extra k squared sitting there. And the argument, I'm going to call it the onsager bachelor fiortoft argument, because various versions of it were given by these three people. We can characterize the scale of the flow by talking about an energy weighted wave number for the energy spectrum. So this is simply a definition of what I mean by k bar. It's like the center of energy on the wave number axis. And then what you might call the spectral width is like the variance about that central wave number. So it's defined here. And through a little manipulation, when you expand the square, you know, there's a cross term minus 2 kk bar, um, which cancels plus k bar squared or and, leave and leaves that term hanging around there. So the spectral width is equal to the ratio of two conserved quantities, the entropy and the energy, minus k bar squared, right? the center of mass of the energy spectrum squared. So what uh, the argument is, if we start off at t equals zero with a very narrow uh, energy spectrum, everything at close to a single wave number with maybe a little bit of spread, then it just seems very uh, plausible that the spectral width would increase. That is, you transfer energy out of the initial scale to adjacent wave numbers. But if the spectral width is increasing and this is constant, then k bar has to be decreasing, which means the center of mass of the spectrum uh, has to go to lower wave numbers. Okay? So if nonlinear interactions broaden an initially narrow spectrum, then the mean wave number must decrease. So this is my plausible, it's not mine, this is a plausibility argument for um, transfer of energy to higher weight, to lower wave numbers. So here's what Batchelor says, I think this is actually in the last, on the last page of his book. The net tendency for the bulk of energy to concentrate in the small wave numbers means that fluid elements with similarly signed vorticity must tend to group together. In no other way is it possible for the scale of the velocity distribution to increase. We expect, therefore, that from the original motion, there will gradually emerge a few strong isolated vortices and that vortices of the same sign will continue to group together. Onsager, 1949, which was four years before this, has arrived at a similar conclusion about the tendency for a small number of strong isolated vortices to form. Now, all of that was um, sort of like a thought experiment until uh, the supercomputers came along. And here's uh, Seymour Cray standing next to his creation in the height of 1970s fashion. Um, and the Cray supercomputer, at least as far as I was concerned, uh, was the first uh, supercomputer that was powerful enough to actually show what happens. So this is the movie I was playing at the start. It's a random initial condition where this is the energy spectrum at t equals zero, you see the rapid formation of uh, vortices, of um, almost axisymmetric vortices. We'll call it a vortex gas. They move under mutual advection. Uh, you see merger events where two red vortices will merge into a single bigger red vortex. Uh, there'll be some stripping, that is, filaments will be torn off the vortices by the uh, differential advection of adjacent vortices. And yet energy is conserved throughout this process. So the energy, it's not correct, I think, to call this decaying two-dimensional turbulence because the energy is conserved to a very good approximation. Um, you wouldn't see anything in between the vortices except for the fact that, I think this was movie was made by Kaushik Srinivasan, except for the fact that Kaushik uh, used a uh, nonlinear color scale so that we could at least see the filaments that exist in between the vortices. Now, um, if we really go to long times, uh, I think we'll see a dipole, that is one big red vortex and one big blue vortex. Uh, this simulation is not going to reach that point. It takes a very long time. Um, but at intermediate times, uh, if we count vortices this and talk about the density of vortices, the number of vortices per square meter, there seems to be a power law decrease. That is, obviously, the number of vortices is decreasing, 
it's decreasing like t to the minus a number which is perhaps 0 0.7, 0 0.75, something like that, a particular exponent, okay? So we just saw the solution of this equation. We were using hyperviscosity. May have said all that. I'd like to remark, following Jim McWilliams, that if you look at these vortices in isolation when they're not close, when they're not strongly interacting uh, with other vortices, then you can take a vortex like that and make a cut through it in two orthogonal directions and overlay the cuts which is what Jim did here, and the two curves fall right on top of each other. So that's an impressive demonstration that this really is close, to, very close to axisymmetry when it's not interacting with other vortices in a destructive way. So in isolation, uh, the vortices are very impressively axisymmetric, and um, because there's such a big difference between the vortex maxima and the filaments in between the vortices, they can easily be identified, well, they can be identified and counted uh, using a sort of automated algorithm that picks out persistent maxima and you can count them. So I'd say the initial emergence of the vortices is not very well understood, uh, but once they appear, uh, we can say something about the statistics of the vortex gas. And in particular, I want to talk just, I want to conclude by talking just a little bit about this scaling law that the number of vortices per unit area uh, decreases algebraically with time with an exponent which is somewhere in between about 0.71 and 0.75. Not very well at all. Um, I should say there's a strong difference between the initial value problem, which is what I'm discussing here, and the forced to forced case, yes. On the other hand, the initial value problem doesn't look anything like equipartition either. Of course, I've got small scale dissipation. No, that's right, but I'm saying y without forcing, you might think that the equipartition uh, had some use, but no. So let's see, what can we say about the number of vortices per unit area? Well, uh, Batchelor didn't make this argument, but he made very similar arguments, so I'll give him the credit for it, especially since it doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> if if we assume that energy is the only robustly conserved quantity in this problem, and it is a robustly conserved quantity, then it has dimensions of length squared over time squared. And what we want uh, is to predict an exponent for the number of vortices per unit area. So this is the only dimensionally correct combination possible if the only thing you let me use is the conserved energy. Okay. I multiply the energy by time squared and I take the inverse and that gives me something with the dimensions of one over length squared, which is the dimensions of the density of vortices. This argument would also predict that the entropy, that is the squared vorticity, uh, would have to, and has dimensions one over t squared, it would simply be proportional to one over t squared, because that's the only way to do it. You can't even use the energy invariant to predict the entropy. Okay. These are the only dimensionally consistent expressions. And they're clearly uh, not correct because the exponent is much slower than t to the minus 2. Okay. Uh, other people have suggested, well, okay, uh, what you should do is think of it as colloidal aggregation where you have objects that move around randomly in space and when two of them bump into each other, like two like signed vortices, uh, there's an annihilation event where one of them disappears. And so that gives you a very simple kinetic equation where the rate of change of density is proportional to density squared because it's a pairwise encounter. Uh, that gives us a density which decreases like one over time, which is also um, too fast relative to what we see from the numerics. So the failure of the energy scaling argument, which is the most physically sensible scaling argument, uh, the most obvious one and the one you try first, means there has to be something else which is robustly conserved. Right? It's just a logical, it's only logic, it's not physics. This, it's, this should have worked and it didn't. So the main assumption that we made was that only energy was important, something else has to matter. And so <coughs> the uh, hypothesis is that uh, in addition to the energy, 
we also conserve uh, vortex extrema. That is, the maxima and minima of the vorticity field seem to be conserved. When you look at the merger events where two vortices merge to make a new product one, a single vortex, th there's a little um, uh, core of the vortices which doesn't get mixed in, and so the vortex extrema uh, seem to be conserved during the events. Okay? So this means if you believe that, then now we can make a length and a time, and it's terrible because now no prediction is possible from dimensional analysis. All we can say is that the density is 1 over length squared, where this is the length, and some function of the non-dimensional time, and uh, you're apparently stuck. Since vort vorticity is materially conserved, uh, that would imply um, that its topology doesn't change, and therefore it should conserve the extrema, right? Yes, although vorticity is not materially conserved because once um, in the filamentary sea between the vortices, stuff is getting stirred by the velocity field of the vortices, and so there's definitely an entropy cascade, and the uh, hyperviscosity that's used in those simulations is destroying the vortex filaments in between the vortices. So if you're a little bit of vorticity sitting right in the center of the vortex, you're shielded from all that. Mm -hmm. You're just going round in circles, and then everything's fine for you. Uh, but those that are tossed out into the sea are just mercilessly cascaded down to small scales and wiped out. Uh, but uh, I mean, just taking the curl of the momentum equations would give you a, a material conservation for vorticity. Yes, but uh, well, plus a viscous term. Plus a viscous term. Okay. So and, and in the movie, this was the viscous term. Right. Okay. It's unimportant inside the vortices. It's quite small. The energy is one on this scale. Um, but in the space in between the vortices, that's destroying the filaments. If you didn't have that term and you had infinite numerical resolution, um, then you'd be correct. You'd be seeing uh, in the filaments the vortex, I every value of vortex would be, every value of vorticity would be conserved. Um, and you'd be, um, you'd simply be creating smaller and smaller scales in the space between the vortices. Uh, but then it would also be very difficult to identify the vortices because you'd have all this large scale uh, filamentary structure with the same amplitude as the vortices themselves. So because of this term is actually important in between the vortices, and it's why the vortices stand out so well from the background. So here's what we can do. Um, we do know there's a power law, and we can make a few arguments now. For instance, <coughs> knowing zeta x, uh, let's introduce what we'll call A of t, which is the typical vortex radius. Now that's a length scale which we know increases from the numerics. The vortices get bigger as a result of like sign mergers. And we can say that the energy is going to be after some hand wavy scaling arguments and assuming that essentially all of the energy is due to the vortices and that none of it is due to the filamentary C between the vortices, the energy is equal to the density of vortices times the square of the extrema times the radius to the fourth power. Okay? This is a scaling argument based on the idea that the velocity of the vortex is proportional to zeta x times a squared, and we're talking about energy, which is the square of the vorticity. So it's the square of zeta x and the fourth power of the radius. Okay? So the energy is conserved, the density is going down, that means the radius has to increase to keep the product constant. And that says that if the radius, if the density is t to the minus of z, then um, the uh, radius of a typical vortex must be growing like t to the plus of z on 4 to hold the energy fixed. Okay? And that means that the circulation of a typical vortex is growing like t to the plus of z on 2 and it predicts all the moments of the vorticity field in terms of that single unknown exponent of z. So in other words, with arguments like this, even though we don't know what xi is, we can relate many statistical um, properties of the gas to the single exponent of xi. 
And these relations that we get from this scaling argument uh, agree pretty well with direct numerical simulation, but there's still no way to predict the scaling argument, uh, to predict the exponent. We can test this idea a little bit further by making a model which is called we call vortex patch dynamics. So a vortex patch uh, moves like a point vortex. That is, it's advected by the velocity field of all the other vortices in the solution, except when two vortex patches get within a critical uh, radius of each other, we merge them into a single new patch, keeping it axisymmetric as part of the rule. So we were motivated to do this by this, it's actually, I think it's a beautiful figure. It was produced by Roberto Benzi and his collaborators. So what they did, they took two-dimensional turbulence. They um, identified uh, the 17 largest vortices in their simulation. Uh, they replaced them by uh, point vortices and moved those 17 point vortices under point vortex dynamics and observed that the point vortex dynamics agreed pretty well with the subsequent evolution of the um, of the vortices that they were matched with at t equals zero. Okay, so it's saying that the vortices, when they move in isolation from one another, pretty much do follow point vortex dynamics if you use the right circulation. So the key here is what we do when we uh, when two of these vortex patches uh, bump into each other. So the rule is that when there's a collision, when the two vortex patches come within a critical distance, and this is the critical separation, nothing depends too much on this rule. The crucial thing is the A to the fourth rule. In order to conserve energy on average, uh, you shouldn't conserve area. You should say that the, uh, you should use the A to the fourth rule, that A th the product vortex with radius A3, A3 to the fourth is A1 to the fourth, plus A2 to the fourth, and that will ensure that energy is conserved on average. Okay. So that's saying that the merger results in lost area, um, and this is sort of an irreversible process that's occurring within the framework of this new equals zero uh, system. So when you do that, it is um, kind of remarkable that I um, the exponent you see uh, is also very close to the exponent. Oh, wrong this figure. Yeah, this is the t to the th this line is t to the three quarters. This is two over rho, and these are the results from the vortex patch simulation. Well, okay, it's not bad, um, and the exponent is pretty close to the observed exponent from the DNS. And that's the end. Thank you. <laughs> Okay. So, question? About uh, the merging of the vortices, what's the dominant collision? Is dipole, uh, dipole or it's uh, two patches? Or two patches, yeah. I don't think we, well, if you look at the movie, it's very hard to see anything except two. Oh, we see dipoles on the movie. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, so you see, you see dipoles with opposite signed vortices, which move very eff effectively. But the merger is only for like signed okay. vortices. So the um, the dipoles are a very effective way, or the only effective way, of sort of stirring up the system when a red one gets together with a blue one and they mutually advect for long distances. But the only merger events are between like signed ones. And and then uh, related to this is what happened when you break the symmetry between blue and red, keeping the average to zero, po positive and negative vorticity? Um, break the symmetry? In the initial condition, say. I don't think uh, people have ever looked at that. Uh, you mean deliberately create, you've got to have zero vorticity on average, but you could imagine creating many, many blue ones and a few big red ones. Yes. So that the that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. 
So for the vortex patch model, uh, there's a critical distance. I'm wondering how you come up with a formula, like from empirical study or like there's some deep physical reason. <laughs> no, it's an empirical study um, done by people like Zabuski. So they did two particle, I mean, two vortex problems numerically, um, <coughs> starting off two like sign vortices. And, and it doesn't depend on, uh, it's just an approximation to more complicated results which were determined empirically um, by studying two vortex problems. Uh, as I say, I don't think, you know, we played around with different versions of this. It didn't make too much difference. This is quite crucial. You could use different powers here and you would change the exponent if you use different powers for the combination law. Hi, I, 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 I'd like to just suggest that maybe all the controversy surrounding this Sandstrom result and everything is, is a bit of a red herring. Uh, roughly speaking, I, I would uh, characterize the behavior of these systems as the energy has nowhere else to go. That's the zero rule of uh, the turbulence. It is only, it can only go to the large scales, okay? Because essentially of the convergence of under the k to the minus five thirds. Now we've seen in both the other examples you've exhibited, both the horizontal convection and two-dimensional convection, that the energy has somewhere else to go and therefore it goes there. In other words, it goes to large-scale motion. So the amount of dissipation uh, can be indeed bounded. Whereas in the three-dimensional turbulence, the energy has nowhere else to go but to the small scales. And that's why you get the anomaly there. Uh, I don't see why you think the horizontal convection problem, which is three-dimensional, uh, is necessarily different from any other three-dimensional no, it, 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 is cert it can certainly be three-dimensional, as in fact is the real two-dimensional turbulence. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the real experiments have a certain depth of yes, yes. whatever you're using, soap film or whatever. Uh, no, but the energy has somewhere else to go. You see, it, it, it can go now into large-scale motion as well as small-scale motion. In the three-dimensional turbulence, the only place it can go is into the small scales. I've got to <laughs> respond to Alan's comment before the next question. In this example, which I think would be, a, we'd agree, would be three-dimensional turbulence, or the platonic ideal of three-dimensional turbulence, you could imagine spinning up a big vortex well, you do spin up a big <laughs> vortex <laughs> in a kitchen blender. Um, so and so there, there is the possibility of putting all the energy into the box scale. And um, that's the same in Sandstrom's theorem. Sorry, that's the same in horizontal convection. We'll come back to this later. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm afraid you went a little too fast in the last two slides for me. Okay. So, uh, I, and I think I missed the argument. So, uh, did you uh, actually use the theory to demonstrate that the exponent is three fourths analytically and compare with simulation of patch, uh, vo patch based vortices, or did you no. derive that numerically? Now what we did, we, s we solved the patch model numerically. Um, so the patches move like point vortices, except when they come within this critical radius, critical separation, and then they merge according to this rule. So that's all done numerically. Um, and here are the results. For instance, here is one on the density, um, showing something which is roughly t to the three quarters. Uh, we have no idea why it's three quarters. It's not predicted analytically. It's a result of the numerics. We do know that if we use a three here instead of a four, uh, 
we will change this slope quite sensitively. So your result is just saying that the vortex patch more wall is a good uh, description of 2D turbulence? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Yes, which is another w reason not to call it turbulence because, for instance, if you follow Benzie and Co., <coughs> what they have shown is that it's this system is very predictable. It's a low-dimensional predictable system because I can take 17 trajectories, that is 34 degrees of freedom, and uh, I can predict for several eddy turnover times uh, the location of those vortices. Yes. So is this 2D uh, turbulence regime perhaps applicable in the ocean at some small domain where rotation does not play a role? I know in the atmosphere you don't see any kind of these things. Um, so I'll, in my last lecture, I'll mention the effect of beta on this problem, which is quite traumatic. So you don't longer see the formation of vortices once you have the beta effect. Yeah, but if you are in a, in a 20, you know, 100 kilometer domain, yeah, something like the Black Sea, maybe, a small marginal sea. Um, even there, I don't see... Um, well, s sorry, people certainly observe vortices in the ocean, but I'm not claiming that they're the, you know, the vortices. Yeah, that vortices. Yeah, yeah. Then let us thank the guy in the bill.